so good morning everyone. My name is Katrin Jutzeler and I'm going to be the host for this morning's session of the second day of the summer school. And so with that, I would like to start with our first presenter who is Joaquin Topazzo. He received his PhD in biology uh, from the University of Valencia. He has many years of experience working in research in academia, but also in industry. So he was, for example, working for Glaxo Welcome, who is now known as GlaxoSmithKline. And since 2017, he is the head of the clinical bioinformatics area, Fundación Progreso y Salud, in Sevilla, in Spain. And he is also a promoter of genomics projects, such as the project called Future Clinic, which aims to prepare the scenario for the introduction of genome in the electronic health records. His research interests include functional genomics, system biology, and also the development of algorithms and software for the analysis of multi-omics data, and particularly its application to precision medicine. He will today talk about mechanistic biomarkers, and we're very excited uh, to have you here, Joaquin, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine, for this nice introduction, and <clears throat> thank you to the organizer for allowing me to, to speak about uh, our work. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about mechanistic biomarker, but since I understand that uh, for many of our students, uh, that could be a <laughs> um, topic uh, a bit away from their backgrounds, I will put the, the, the problem in context before, or I will try at least. So um, let me start by explaining you what are biomarkers. So this is, this is um, a scheme of how medicine uh, works and how medicine will work in the future and how medicine is changing nowadays. So we are, I mean, since, I mean, I would they say that since the times of, uh, of Hippocrates, but <laughs> probably for more than a couple of centuries, the medicine, the modern medicine has been working in an intuitive way, meaning that uh, um, clinicians which were ex experts in specific uh, parts of the medicine, they were better or not so good <laughs> in defining symptoms and uh, Definition of symptoms is something a bit, uh, you know, um, um, not uh, accurate in many cases and not objective in many cases. So, uh, with the advent of uh, sequencing technologies, we had the opportunity of starting to find uh, a completely different type of markers, not. Uh, just physiological markers, but what we call biomarkers, which are specific mutations in the genome that could be associated to diagnosis, specific diagnostics, or to prognostic of the disease, or to response to specific uh, drugs, right? So this is a completely different change because no matter how good is the clinician, if you have a biomarker, which uh, is a non-subjective uh, definition of the disease, you will be correctly diagnosed or you will be treated correctly or I mean, understand correctly in a, in a context, in a probabilistic context, hmm? because this uh, identification of biomarkers is, um, is um, just a, a probabilistic uh, fact, right? This is, mm, the idea is that as you find more, as you get uh, or you collect more information on patients and you finally mm, uh, find association between a specific mutation and specific response treatment, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And that uh, has uh, meant a, a, an important advancement for, for, for medicine, right? But this, this uh, uh, biomarkers are only probabilistic association. It doesn't tell us many things about the biological me mechanism behind. Uh, we can imagine a future in which we know as perfectly all the mechanisms behind the diseases, etc. 
uh, that uh, we will be able of taking decisions or actions based on the knowledge of these mechanisms. Because now if we find somebody with a completely new mutation, uh, we don't have the previous uh, probabilistic uh, identification of this mutation, and probably we are not going to be able to say anything about this mutation. So for us, this patient is an, uh, an unknown, right? But in the future, if we know how the mechanism uh, works, we will be able of taking decisions even in situations that we have never seen before, right? That, that's the idea. So um, this is the type of, of biomarker that you, we use nowadays. There, there are mutations in, in single genes. What, what you have on your left here is the, the page of the Food and Drug Administration where all the all this uh, approved, uh, all the all the biomarkers with an approved drug are listed, which, which are in the range of thousands. And this is an example of uh, how biomarkers have contributed to the improvement of the practice of medicine. So this is the uh, improvement in survival since uh, early 70s in the last century to the beginning of, of this century. Mm -hmm. Meaning that the average survival in cancer that was one in four in, in the beginning of, beginning of the, this uh, century uh, passed to one in two. And now it's, uh, it's 75, it's around 70% nowadays. And this is only because we know how to stratify patients and how to treat patients more and more efficiently because we uh, can detect in these patients biomarkers which are associated to success or to probabilistic success in a given treatment, right? So uh, most personalized therapies are based on this type of biomarkers. So this is the, the optimistic, the optimistic uh, view. <laughs> Um, what happened with the uh, biomarkers? Uh, well, I mean, they are okay, and they are okay for, for example, for the diagnosis of rare diseases, uh, because they are highly penetrant diseases uh, with a very clear uh, phenotype and very clear symptomatology. Mm, they have been successful in cancer, more or less because the same, but uh, for most uh, complex diseases, uh, like, uh, you know, diabetes, hypertension, um, many other diseases, um, the success was not so, so good. Uh, the point is that we are looking for probabilistic associations and we saw yesterday <coughs> a very nice presentation uh, in which uh, uh, you could see a probabilistic association of SNPs to trites and uh, in many cases this association uh, um, I mean, the, 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 the uh, success of this association, the practical success of this, the part of the phenotype explained by this association is not very high. Um, and what happened also is that uh, in many cases, this uh, association lack uh, the mechanistic anchoring or the mechanistic explanation uh, of the fundamental processes uh, responsible for the disease of the therapeutic response. So what happened in more complex diseases, but in general, is that uh, the phenotypes are not uh, uh, defined by a single gene. Like for example, in, rare, in most rare inherited diseases, uh, the phenotype is caused by one single gene. But in, in other diseases, uh, it's, it's a combination of um, mutations of damaged genes, uh, typically in combination also with, with some um, uh, environmental uh, reason. This is what they call the exposome, which I mean, all these conditions, external conditions to which we are exposed to. Uh, so in that case, it's very difficult to find these, these relationships. 
Um, but we know that uh, most of the diseases or the complex diseases are caused by these combination of genes. And there are several proofs, like, for example, this very famous paper of Goth in 2007, in which they demonstrated that um, in many cases, all the genes, genes causing the same disease or similar diseases, map together in the protein protein interaction network, for example. So genes tend to, to um, to form substructures which are responsible for phenotypes. So this, uh, what we call these modules. Mm -hmm. These modules could be just a physical module, like uh, it could be a protein complex, which is a like a mega protein uh, um, formed by the assembly of different proteins, or they can be just genes cooperating, like in the case of a, a metabolic network in which different genes, different proteins are uh, transforming, metabolized into other metabolites and they, they work like in a factory, right? So, um, well, I mentioned that, that that's the problem of using single gene biomarkers that are, doesn't explain, explain the, the, the systems and the, the interaction between the genes. But, I mean, I mentioned that most of the biomarkers are single gene, but this is not uh, completely true. So there are uh, several multi, multi, multigenic biomarkers, and one of the most famous ones is the MAMA print, which is uh, just a uh, decision support test for cancer, in which they, in which they, they um, test or this, this biomarker or this multigenic biomarker predicts the probability of uh, metastasis in case of uh, breast cancer, right? So what is interesting is that this, this uh, predictor was, uh, was proposed in 2003, as far as I remember, so very I mean, many years ago. And by the time in which it was proposed, the function of many of the genes were completely unknown. So nowadays that we know all the functions, probably you cannot see it here because it's very small, the, the, the table is very small, but all the functions of the genes are related to uh, breast cancer. So what these uh, multigenic biomarkers is capturing is an idea of a module which is active in one or another way and therefore, uh, this activity will cause this. Uh, you have the module in this with this activity. No matter what combination of genes is causing this activity, probably you will develop a metastasis. So in that case, we are having a better picture of what a module is than in the case of a single uh, a single biomarker, a single gene biomarker. So that our idea then was to try to, to, to change a little bit the paradigm and um, well, in the case of mama print and other multigenic biomarker, that was a bottom-up uh, definition. So uh, they define, managed to define the, the, the module before to know what the, the genes do. But something that we can use, do is to use all the knowledge that we already have on biology to try to define these modules and then to use the modules like biomarkers, right? Uh, so we have two problems here. The first problem is defining these functional modules. And the second problem would be to define the behavior of, of, the, of the modules. So we have different, I mean, historically, we have been managing different types of uh, uh, biological knowledge about these modules. And the first one was gene ontology. Gene ontology is just an a, a, a ontological description of functions. Uh, maybe now that sounds stupid, but if we go back to the beginning of bioinformatics and all this stuff, when the journal bioinformatics was called uh, Computer Application in Bioscience, KBIOS and not, not bioinformatics. So I'm talking about uh, uh, the early 90s of the last century. Um, 
No, I'm not younger than I look like, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> so, um, by these times, um, uh, one of the main problems was that uh, the definition of function in the genes were just description in human uh, language. Uh, there was not an ontology, so it was almost impossible to try to find genes that do the same because in different publications, the definition we by a human were coincident, but you cannot read with a computer all the definition and put them together. So that was a clear advancement, just the use of a unique ontology for definition. So, but at the end, you can you can think of these terms like bags of genes, which share a function, right? The problem of using that. Uh, modules is that you completely lose the information on how the components within the path uh, relate among them. So the second uh, type of information that was very useful for a uh, long while was the interaction. So the, the description of protein, the, the network of protein-protein interactions. Um, yeah, I mean, it was quite good because um, in that case it describes how proteins relate among them. But the problem is that uh, the interactome itself has no information on the functional roles of the components. So we don't know, we, we know, firstly, in the case of gene ontology, we know why they are together. Uh, in the case of interactome, we know who connects to whom, but we don't know why they are together. But, um, we, we also have these uh, pathways. So the pathways are a completely different uh, type of description biology. Um, they were originated by the classical biochemistry in which uh, you draw these diagrams in which uh, you relate genes to other by arrows, by different types of arrows, which, meet, which uh, uh, account for different functionality that relate one gene to the other. Um, so this is probably the most interesting type of, of, uh, of description of, of um, functional module, right? So um, let me just mention that um, uh, with these pathways, let me show you the next slide. There, there are many different, uh, well, not many, but there are a number of, of, uh, of um, repositories in which you can find pathways. For the most uh, known part of the pathways, all these repositories have similar, um, you know, uh, circuitry. Uh, maybe in new, I mean, the stuff which is uh, discovered more recently, they diverge a little bit, but they tend to, to be more or less uh, similar, right? So uh, let me explain this, this type of, of pathway. This type of pathway describe how genes relate to each other to make the cell do things, right? So uh, we are going to talk about two type of, of pathway. There are, there are more, but let me just focus on two very important type of pathways. One of them would be a signaling pathways. Similarly, but you, you can imagine them like uh, electrical circuits. So you can imagine that you are in a, in a, in a big building in which uh, you can just switch on and off switches and things happen. So lights go, uh, go on and off. Uh, you can open doors, you can do things, right? So these, these switches have uh, an effect on some part of the building that would be this effect would be the, the, the phenotype of the building. So you, are, you can change, you can operate on the, on the building by just switching the, 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 the switch, right? So the, this is um, uh, a good symbol for the, for the um, um, signaling pathway. So at the end, the signaling pathways receive a uh, uh, stimulus, which is your finger <laughs> clicking the, the switches, and transmit the signal to the part of the cell in which 
uh, uh, an action should happen, right? For example, uh, a stimulus tells the cell that uh, the cell must produce more lipids to increase the size of the of the of the membrane, for example, or whatever. So anything in the cell happens because this. Uh, um, signaling and the signaling map is quite correct, quite correctly described, right? So we have these uh, these uh, uh, repositories, and we have all also these all different type of repositories which uh, um, collect the peculiarities of of the signaling metabolism, etc., et et in the case of different diseases. So there are these disease maps, right? So. Uh, we decided that pathways are very good for defining um, these modules that probably will account for, for the diseases. And now we have to decide how to model uh, uh, the, this, this, this um, activity. And the, but the first thing that we need is to define what is uh, activity, what is biological activity within a pathway, because we don't know which are the um, elementary active action that trigger a function, right? So at the end, this is like a, a, the complete description of an electrical map of the of the building, and you will get completely lost if you try to figure out what what is causing what, right? So. Um, this is an important part in, the, in this type of modeling. Um, this is a very sm small example. Um, you can go to the gene level, to the pathway level, to the whole full pathway level, or the sub-pathway level, right? If you go to the, to the gene level, which would be the equivalent to the, to the case of using um, single gene biomarkers, uh, for example, here, if you think that the activity of this gene is is uh, relevant, uh, probably is relevant, but it depends very much on the partners which are active. It can lead, it can trigger a signal of survival, or it can trigger a signal of cell death. Right. So, uh, the activity of this gene alone, uh, out of context, of the rest of the context, say nothing about what this pathway, the apoptosis pathway, is doing in the cell. Yeah. Same can be said at the level of pathway. So you say that, okay, I have a lot of genes active here. So the, the apoptosis pathway is active. Yeah, okay, but what the apoptosis pathway is doing? Is killing the cell or is making the cell survive? So um, this is important to define. So, uh, what is important then is the subpathway level. So, the subpathway that connects the part of the circuit that receives the um, um, signal, the first signal, the stimulus, and until the last protein that triggers the function, right? Uh, if you decompose the pathway in this uh, canonical or elementary circuit, you will have uh, an idea of the different functions that the pathway can trigger and when this, fun when this function are triggered. So you essentially decompose the pathway in the different elementary functions, right? And uh, once we know how to decompose the pathway in this elementary function, we can model it. So this is uh, probably the first, um, I mean, the first uh, case that I know, maybe there's, there are more before, but this is quite elegant to me. So this is a very simple and small sub-pathway, which is the giant K um, sub-pathway. So the inability for, of, Activating this this pathway, which uh, uh, which sends the, the cell to apoptosis, is associated with a very bad prognostic uh, in the case of of uh, uh, neuroblastoma patients. Right. So this is the 
MIC-N is the, the, the typical uh, mutations in the MIC, uh, uh, in, the, in this case, an amplification in the MIC-N is, uh, is a biomarker of bad prognostic. But they know that uh, many, I mean, a number of patients with a MIC-N amplification, uh, I mean, don't have a so bad um, a prognostic. And some people with no amplification in MIC-N have a bad prognostic. So there is something missing there. So uh, if they, well, when they focus on this uh, sub pathway, they calculated or they estimated the um, activity of the sub pathway, they discover that the activity of this sub pathway, meaning when, when the pathway was not active, the prognostic was clearly bad. Um, they, they found a very nice association. Uh, yeah, because essentially because the cell could not enter when the cell was clearly uh, neoplastic uh, and the, the cell realizes that they uh, trigger suicide. But in that case, the, the suicide was inhibited, right? So that means that the cancer cell could spread out. No? So what is interesting here is that the activity of the pathway is more related to the um, to the prognostic than the activity of any of the genes involved in the pathway. So this is exactly the definition of a system. The system explains more the phenotype in that case than the sum of the, the, the parts of the system, right? And what is interesting is that they, they were not measuring the activity of the pathway. They didn't have a, a way of measuring the activity of the pathway. They infer the activity of the pathway. So this is a construct. This is not a real measurement, but this is a measurement uh, which was inferred from the real measurements of individual um, uh, genes that by themselves do not explain correctly the phenotype. But when you put them together in a model that explain all the model, they, then in that case, they uh, have a better explanation for the phenotype. So this is right, but the problem that the making this um, models with differential equation was um, problematic when you try to scale up to the, 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 the bigger system. So given that there is uh, this um, nice uh, sim uh, similarity between um, electrical circuits and signaling, so um, I mean, there are different ways of, of, uh, of modeling that, but we, we were modeling the, this uh, um, you know, this propagation of, of the signal through the circuits in a more or less similar way to a, uh, to a circuit. Thinking that, uh, um, thinking of genes like resistors. So the idea is that when one of these genes uh, have a high expression, then there is a low resistance to the to pass to electricity. And if the genes is poorly expressed, there is not much gene, then there is a high resistance to the pass of the electricity. Uh, this, this is for genes which activate the genes. If the gene is an inhibitor of the NS gene, then the, the, is the other way around, right? So then in that way, we can model these two type of activities. And uh, um, you've seen in this, this uh, iterative formula. And uh, we just uh, start with a signal of one, and we see well, how much of this signal arrives to the end. So you apply this formula with this with this uh, gene. I mean, these are normalized gene expression um, levels. So we, we, we normalize all of them. We put them in a scale from zero to one. And uh, so they are relative values. They are not absolute values. And then we start with a signal of one. And for example, the gene which is expressed at 0 0.7, so it will allow to pass only a 0 0.7 of the signal. So this is 0 0.1, so it only passes 10% uh, of this 0 0.7. But when you have more than one, you, you, you um, sort of uh, join the, the, the um, signal. 
So at the end, in that case, in this toy example, you have 0 0.51 Cs here. Uh, yeah, you may think, so 0 0.516 is a high uh, level of scenery, no, it's a low level of scenery. Um, what do you think? Probably you don't know, but neither do I, right? So we, we don't know, but it's exactly like if I, if I say, so 0 0.6 is a high level of gene expression or not? Nobody knows. That, that, that values have a meaning in the context of a comparison. So 0 0.5 is a high level of expression if in your controls, the expression was 0 0.01. But if you control the expression was 0 0.9, then it's a low expression. But then you, you have, you convert, the, um, you know, this um, a dimensional values in other dimensional values that you can compare uh, among them, right? Um, so, um, well, I mean, uh, so we have then this, this type of, of model. So, um, just a couple of things on these models. Um, what is interesting is there are mechanistic models. That means that uh, the transduction of the signal through the model has a consequence. Hmm? And this, 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 this is a, this is a um, 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 you know, uh, this is a causal, there is a causality here. Uh, but this is a causality um, provided by the biology. Right? This is not, we were, we had yesterday a very nice talk about causality, but inferring ca causality. So in that case, we, we know this causal relationship because the model tells us how uh, the genes uh, relate among them to trigger this functionality, right? In the, uh, another interesting thing is that this model can predict quantitatively. It's not um, just uh, uh, quali uh, qualitative prediction is a quantitative prediction as well. So at the end, what we are doing here is just transforming this measurement that we can do into um, that has not a clear meaning by themselves into something that has a clear meaning because there are these uh, uh, signal activities what what that trigger functionalities. So at the end, it's a similar concept to mama print. At the end, it's a formula by which you can, in that case, you calculate the risk, in that case, you can calculate other cell activities, right? Um, so, um, in a way, we could think of these models like um, a way of providing high throughput estimation of uh, cell functionalities, meaning that you, instead of doing this conversion, um, these cumbersome some experiments and when you go one by one function at a time trying to figure out how this function um, metabolic or whatever in, 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 the, in, the, in an individual or in a number of mice or cells or whatever is changing instead of doing all these cumbersome experiments just by measuring gene expression in one single experiment you can have a profile of how all the functions are changing in, in the, in the, within the cell, right? And actually it's quite interesting because you can map this function to higher level functions. Uh, for example, in the case of cancer, you can map specific uh, pathway functionalities to, um, to uh, specific uh, cancer hallmarks, to specific uh, functionalities which are uh, typical from cancer cell, right? So let me let me show you the application of these uh, models to several scenarios. Joaquin, sorry, yeah. I have to interrupt you again. Um, the, the, this high pitch tone is still here. I'm not sure if you're too close to the microphone, maybe? Uh, maybe. <laughs> because it got better when you stand up but yeah okay now, now it's the, the now it's it's good again okay yeah. okay sorry okay thank you maybe i have to <laughs> i tend to move myself <laughs> yeah 
sometimes it will move closer. Okay, so here is okay. Right. Yes, it's gone. Thank you. Okay, so let me show you um, this graph here. So this is um, a function in the cell, which is DNA replication. So DNA replication is something uh, which is triggered clearly in the case of cancer, right? DNA replication is triggered from these two pathways, cell cycle and P53, through these four sub pathways, right? If you take real data, the patients from the TCGA, from the Cancer Anatomy Genome Project, um, um, and you in this in this for this patient you have gene expression and you have the survival right if you uh, look at the survival of the patient with a high dna replication or with a low dna replication you can see clearly a significant difference in survival so people with a high uh, dna replication has clearly clearly uh, worse pronostic that the patient with a low um, activity DNA replication. I mean, which makes sense. What we are doing is just detecting within these patients um, an activity which is related with um, cancer activity, right? As before, DNA replication is a construct. It's not, we are, we are not Measure, we don't have measurements of DNA replication. We are inferring DNA replication activity in the cell from the activity of the genes, given that they are linked in that way, right? So you may think that it could be um, just <laughs> by, 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 by random, right? But you look at other, uh, what they are called cancer hallmarks, with the, you look at other characteristics of cancer that can be measured or can be mapped to, to cell, uh, to cell um, activities, you see that apart from DNA replication, for example, cell adhesion is clearly related to uh, uh, metastasis. So individuals with a down regulation, with, a down, with low activity of cell adhesion have clearly, again, a significant bad pronostic, with, uh, worse than the, the individuals with the normal, I uh, mean, with higher activity. Uh, for example, uh, positive regulation of angiogenesis. So people who uh, make more uh, blood vessels, who has more angiogenic activity, have worse pronostic, again. And this is uh, apoptosis, so inhibition of apoptosis. This, this uh, negative regulation of this of cytochrome C from mitochondria is a, is a marker of, of non-apoptosis, of inhibition of apoptosis. So people with, uh, in which we detect uh, a clear inhibition of apoptosis have, again, a bad pronostic. So we are just uh, having a very nice picture of what is in the cell in terms of functionality and clearly in functions related to the phenotype, right? Just by modeling these, uh, these uh, pathways. Uh, like in the case, in the previous case that I showed you, um, what is interesting to see here is that um, the um, relationship or the association of the value infer value is much better for the activity of the pathway than for the activity of any of the genes composing the pathway. Right? Again, the system is more than the sum of its parts. I mean, it makes sense because it means that what is important is the DNA, the DNA replication and the DNA replication can be activated in different ways. So maybe the best gene this gene which has a very high association uh, maybe is the most prevalent way in which by by means this pathway is activated but not the only one so the better descriptor of the phenotype then is the activity of the of the pathway 
So again, something which is interesting is that um, in different cancers, you see the same pattern of act activation of the functions, but coupled by different genes, right? So the profile of gene activity that activates the same function is different. For example, this is breast cancer, this is uh, kidney cancer. And that has uh, very important consequences in, in, in for, you know, for treatments. Uh, clinic. For example, if you decide that this gene is important because it's very active and you have a drug that we do inhibit the gene and you get an inhibition here and you try this drug which works in, in kidney cancer, you try this work in breast cancer, probably it will not work because this gene is not especially active here. The activation is done through other uh, pathways, right? We will see that uh, in, a, in a more detailed example later. Um, so, um, yeah, okay, you, you can see many things. Um, you can do a lot of studies, for example, uh, you can detect uh, uh, processes which are more important uh, for cancer initiation that they just uh, increase. This, uh, this, uh, this graph uh, show the different stages in cancer, so the, the initiation of the cancer are more uh, aggressive states. Then in that case, for example, uh, there is an increase in the very beginning and then uh, is more or less the same. Uh, so probably cell cycle has more to do with cancer initiation, but for example, cell division has to do with cancer progression because there is a a growing trend across all, all the states. So you can do a lot of um, very interesting studies at the level of mechanisms um, with, with this type of models. Now you can use circuits for many other things. So you can, you can use circuits in the context of prediction. So uh, instead of doing predictor with what you are measuring, that are the gene activities, you can transform the gene activities into circuit activities, which have um, more uh, clear uh, meaning within the functionality of the cell. And you can use these uh, profiles of, um, of um, circuit activity for doing any type of predictors, um, continuous variable, case contrast, et cetera. You can use a training set and then you can do a prediction. Let me show you this um, paper in which uh, we were able of predicting the drug sensitivity values from, from the, act the activity of the signal in circuits. I mean, it, it looks, maybe it doesn't look a very good prediction, but biology is like this. So what you get with, with genes is not, uh, genes alone is not much better. What is interesting here is that um, you can, um, in the features, uh, that the predictor selects, you can have at the same time uh, the level of importance of these features in, the, in defining the, the predictor. So you are sort of learning biology from the data. So you can just see uh, what uh, the predictor consider important for defining the differences between your cases and your control. So in that way, you can sort of uncover what is the mechanism behind. Um, um, okay, so um, this is an um, interesting application that we made a uh, uh, few months ago, which is um, trying to understand what are the gender specific uh, mechanisms that a cancer responds to cancer treatment. So it is well known that uh, in some cancer, not all of them, but in some cancer, there are differences in the response between uh, uh, men and women. And it is known that there are some uh, differences in gene expression, but uh, um, 
the link between these two, two I mean, with this gene, the genes activities and the response to drive was not clear. So, um, um, I mean, we apply this, this um, methods to try to, to, to interpret the gene expression profiles uh, in terms of pathway signaling activities and trying to see how do they account for the different uh, functional activities of the cell, how these um, activities relate to these cancer hallmarks, right? So this is a, a scheme of the publication. I'm not going to enter in, in, in details, but these are the, the different types of cancer here on the left, how through different um, um, circuits belonging to different uh, pathways account for uh, on the right part from account for different uh, uh, cancer hallmarks for example of genome instability mutation angiogenesis uh, immortality ev evading signaling um, uh, sustaining proliferative signaling etc etc and resisting cell death the cell death right so um, you can see that for example um, Cell cycle, cell cycle, uh, cell cycle through apoptosis and angiogenesis are uh, main players here in this in this um, in this game, right? And this is, um, but this is uh, how different. Uh, these are different representation that how different cancer um, are affected by different uh, gender, gender specific gene expression. So we calculated the uh, impact of gene expression on cell signaling. Then we uh, transform cell signaling into fun cell functionalities and we map these cell functionalities on, um, on this uh, hormone. And we see that there are different strategies in different cancers but um, for example it's, it looks like uh, if sustaining proliferative signaling is the more important for almost all the cancer not for all of them but so this is a very nice dissection of how different uh, genes affect to different functionalities so that leads me to another uh, important point uh, that I briefly mentioned before this is the relationship between uh, mechanistic models and, caus and causality. So um, I have shown you how we can use the mechanistic models to uh, to try to understand what is going on within the cell, right? But the important thing is that we can use the models for more things, like for saying, okay, uh, I have this system. And what would happen if I change this part of the system? I can recalculate the system, inventing a situation that doesn't exist, and then I compare with the original situation. So I can just uh, say, what would be the effect in terms of functionality of this intervention? And by intervention, I mean many types of intervention. Uh, knockouts, I mean switching off a gene or switching on a gene. Overexpression, knockouts, uh, you can just uh, um, uh, simulate the effect of a drug, and you can do many things, right? So we, we um, try to see if uh, it does work, right? And we, for example, we use this um, real data from survival of cell lines. So cell lines are, are uh, constitute a very um, simple system. So it's a cancer cell line, which is immortal and uh, lives by themselves and you can do things. Uh, so uh, to some extent you can um, uh, figure out what happened in the cancer, but it's not exactly uh, a real cancer because it's not within a body. So uh, in the case of cell lines, uh, they only survive or die. So they, they have not a very, uh, you know, uh, they have not a variety of phenotypes. It's not like a, a cancer within you that can be uh, 
angiogenesis, apoptosis, uh, well, apoptosis can have in the cells as well, but we can have more, more functionalities, but in the case of cell, uh, cancer cell lines, so they only survive or not, right? So they, they did a massive, they did massive knockouts in different cell lines, and they have the results. So we, we know the, um, you know, the, the original gene expression profiles of these cells, and we know the knockouts, and the result of the knockout. So what we did was to simulate these knockouts and to see what happened. And what we discovered is that there are uh, circuits which are positively related or negatively related with survival. And we call them onco circuits when they were positively uh, related to, to, to survival and two more supersal circuits when they were negatively related to um, to survival. Uh, it's not a matter of chance that many known uh, oncogenes and many known tumor supersol genes are within this corresponding circuit. So they are oncogenes because they are in onco circuits. And since we are in the case of cell lines, most of them are related to um, proliferation. And in the case of tumor suppressor, with anti-proliferation, right? Essentially, so it's not it was not a surprise, but it's, it's nice. So this is a the, the validation of the model is I mean it's like the, here. For example, you have a circuit activity here. Uh, you know that these genes one, two, and three, uh, one and two were uh, clearly related, and three not related. And this is because you know, in that case you are here or here you are switching off the circuit, but in that case, the signal, in the case of three, the signal can go through other ways, so you are not switching off the circuit, right? So then you can predict the, um, the, the, the activity of, since we, we can predict the activity of the circuit, we, we can predict what would be the effect of knockouts in the rest of the genes. And what we found is that uh, actually we obtained a 70, 5% of correct predictions um, in, in, in the, when we predict what would happen to the, to the cells. Hmm? Essentially, when you deactivate a, a tumor suppressor module, you get more uh, activity, and when you deactivate an onco module, you get a lower survival in, in, the, in the genes. And this is what we observe. So we have this server in which you can you can just um, simulate this um, this gene activation, the activation, whatever. Uh, essentially, this is what you do: is you, you upload a, a, a given condition, and you can change by hand the activity value of a given gene, which is your target. You can rise or low or lower the, 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 the activity, you put the activity to zero, and then it's like an absolute uh, knockout or a absolute inhibition. If you put this activity to one, it would be a, a, um, overactivation of the gene. And then you recalculate the system and you compare with the original system. And you get something like this inhibition. This is the, the interface of um, the path act, which is now within Hepatia, right? And you get uh, an effect here in this pathway through this three, four sub pathway, but you get some um, effects in other pathways because the gene is shared for more than one pathway. Uh, so this is what you get uh, in transcription, angiogenesis, etc., in other pathways, etc., etc. And you can simulate more. Um, you can simulate the activity of a drug. So we, we know for many drugs uh, what are the targets, which are inhibiting or enhancing or whatever. And you can calculate what are the um, potential inhibition in this specific system. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, when we compare, you remember this slide when we were comparing uh, kidney cancer with breast cancer. Uh, a drug which could, which could be very very active and very useful in one cancer could not be active in the other cancer because the configuration of the gene is different. So you are inhibiting a gene which is already inhibited, right? 
Uh, this is an example of uh, knockout prediction in this uh, small uh, sub pathway. Uh, we predict this um, uh, inhibition of this UB, UPD1, uh, which was not present in the Achilles. So that was a complete prediction that we made. Uh, it will kill the cell, and actually, our collaborator did an example, and uh, it was killing the cell, right? So was, uh, that was a modelization of metabolic pathways. Uh, now we use a similar so metabolic pathways are not exactly like signaling because uh, what we have is a transformation of of, um, of products, you know, a different product. So there is not. Uh, I mean, the concept, for example, of inhibition doesn't exist here in a similar way. Uh, but, but I mean, we could do the similar um, predictions, right? Uh, for example, this is a, um, a prediction of what's happening in, uh, of, the, of the different metabolite that would be uh, more active or inactive in different types of cancers. So you have here, uh, these are the different cancers, right? The cancer types. And in columns, you have metabolites. So you have some metabolites which are very, very active in, in, in cancer. So for example, what you have here on the right is uh, there are nucleotides. So the production of nucleotides is absolutely, I mean, they are producing metabolites they're, they're producing, um, sorry, they're, this, this metabolite, they're nucleotides. So cancer is producing nucleotides like crazy because these are the bricks of the DNA. So they are reproducing and they are producing uh, DNA. So they are essentially producing DNA and lipids for the membrane. Uh, this is universal. You have a universal non-production of some uh, metabolite, which are uh, more specific of cell, but not from cancer cell, which are uh, um, uh, we make uh, themselves unspecific. And then in different cancer, because of the different you know peculiarities of the cancer, they have different profiles, so you can analyze one by one, right? Again, when you uh, look at the survival of patients according to the metabolites, which were predicted to be uh, um, here more or less active, uh, you see clear patterns, clear different patterns of, of, of survival, right? So let me just change a little bit and go to a more um, specific. We, we're going to dissect now the problem. We, are going to the to single cells. So now um, the sequencing technologies has advanced a lot, and we can analyze the cancer at the level. I mean, the cancer. We can analyze the gene expression at the level of single cell. So uh, obviously, cancer uh, has a lot of interest because we know that there are a lot of always suspected, but now we know that there was a lot of. Uh, variability at the level I mean within the cells right so this is this is an example with um, uh, glioblastome cells so when you um, just analyze the cells in terms of uh, um, gene expression pattern or the corresponding uh, cell activity pattern you can see different groups different clusters corresponding to different types of cells so you have the cancer cells, and you have cells around, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, or real um, brain cells, and other cells which are in the matrix, right, of the uh, around. So you don't have a, uh, uh, you cannot have a um, sample with a complete purity. You do capture some cells around. So when you analyze the cancer cells, they are not similar. And actually, you can distinguish three clusters within them, more or less. And interestingly, if you transform the, um, the profiles of sig the signaling profiles into functionality, you see that there are, they have 
completely different strategies. Well, I mean, these two ones <laughs> have more similar, but there is one who have a completely different strategy, right? Uh, which is interesting because that, that means that you have within your cancer different cells. But uh, this is not good, and you will see why. This is not good because when you treat, this is a simulated treatment, right? So we just uh, use the drug that we use in, the, in glioblastone, which is the bevacizumab. And when we simulate the treatment with bevacizumab, what we see is that in, for most of the cells, you have a high, I mean, a big effect, right? Meaning that it is interrupting uh, a lot of pathways within the cell. But well, there is a small percentage of the cell for which uh, this inhibition has not very, uh, has not a high effect, right? Then we can go cell by cell and see what happened. And let me show you this because this is very interesting. This is one of the subpathways which is relevant and actually is one of the subpathways in which the, the, the drug uh, is acting. So this is the VEF pathway. Um, in which, um, I mean, this drug, this bevacizumab, is an inhibitor of BEF, right? So what we find here is that love responder cells, so this is, this is, this is um, the first node that uh, triggers all the signaling through the uh, BEF pathway. And in this first, this first node is composed by many genes, meaning that any of these genes, one, two, there are, uh, I think, there are more than this, but, but the other are more, less relevant. So any of these genes can trigger the signal. Hmm? Uh, if, the, if, this trigger, if this signal is triggered, so there is a lot of proliferation, so you have the, the cancer active, right? Uh, what happened is that in the cells which are sen sensitive to the, which are responding to the treatment, you have, this is the red ones, you have a lot of BEF. You have other BEF, BEF A, BEF B, right? But what happened with the cells which are not responding? In them, you don't have BEF A. You don't even have BEF B. So you're inhibiting a gene which is not there. So actually you have this PDGFD, which is a, another gene. So when you are, doing is to inhibit a gene which is not there in these genes and this is in this cell and this cell are triggering the signal through other genes so we have been able of dissecting why a cell is not responding what what are what is the me mechanism the molecular mechanism by which this cell is evading the response so we, we can try we are using this for i mean in many different scenarios but this is a a, a proof of how interesting and how mm, these models could be applied in, in a real situation. So let me show you more stuff. So this is um, mm, something that we have not published yet, but um, mm, we are on the way. So we get again all the result of this massive uh, experiment of Achilles. Uh, with they, they do massive knockouts in cell lines. And we have this proliferation score. So we have uh, now in this version uh, 628 cell lines corresponding to different tissues. And for any of the cell lines, they knock out gene one, they knock out gene two, etc. etc. Et they knock out a lot of these, and, and, and we know what happened there, right? Um, then we have the, these values, right? So what we do is to take all these knockouts, convert this to these knockouts to the uh, to all the cell lines map in the uh, relate this the effect of these knockouts and map with I mean all, in all the cell lines and map them with the with the value. And we have this result. We are going to transform this. Uh, cell line values into profiles of activity and we have the profile of activity and we have the, the uh, big matrix with the with the um, 
with the values, right? So we have all these knockouts, uh, uh, about a thousand circuits, and we have we are going to predict a binary value, which is quite unbalanced because most of the knockouts don't do don't have effect on the cell, right? Only ten percent of the knockouts kill the cell. Think about thinking that you have to think that many of these genes are completely irrelevant in a cell line because they, they account for the function of the cell that's happening in the body, but they are living alone, so they don't need these genes. And then we we, we use a machine learning and assemble of, uh, classifiers with Bayesian hyperparameter optimization that will account with take into account all this uh, this imbalance right in the in the parameters. So we we use uh, to measure the the uh, accuracy. We use a um, strategy of uh, leaving one cell line out. We call it logo, which means crazy in Spanish. <laughs> and uh, uh, okay, and we measure the, the, the we use two strategies. The, we use um, ex, uh, explain, explainable boosting machine and extreme gradient boost boosting. That case is a bit more accurate, but we lose a little bit the, the inter interpretability. And we will find this a very good prediction. So the prediction is what will happen with the genes in a new cell line, in a cell line which has not been used in, in the training of the, of the system. So what you observe is something which is obvious is that for the cases in which we have more, I mean, a bigger training sample, we get better prediction, but still there are quite good predictions. Right. Um, and this is the rock curve and the precision recall, recall curve, which is more descriptive of what, what is happening here because we have a quite unbalanced, uh, um, you know, um, the system. So these are the more relevant circuits uh, selected by the predictor, and we have. Uh, Cell cycle and TOR was the favorite circuit that explained, uh, which is, uh, I mean, which was expected, but explained uh, most of the survival of the cell, right? So, this is uh, again a representation, a more detailed representation of the specific circuit. And what you can see that different in different cell lines, you have different types of, um, of um, different strategies. And um, uh, that would be uh, the, the, this is the, um, the number of, uh, this is, for example, the breast cancer, there's a specific cell lines, and you have here the number of, of uh, true positive and false positive among the, the first uh, uh, genes predicted within any of the cells as um, what they call uh, essential genes, so seeing genes that you knock out then the cell, you will kill the cell, right? So as you can see, I mean, the prediction is, is quite good, not exactly for all the genes. There are some systematic errors, etc. But I mean, if you take the first 10 genes, you will kill the cell almost for sure in, in, any, in any of the cases, right? So um, we can use this concept not only for, you, for that, but also for studying um, what is the effect in, of mutations in, in, in complex diseases? So, you know what happened in the case of, um, of uh, rare diseases, there are a lot of predictors of loss of function of a gene, uh, which are used to, um, as predictors of, of, uh, of pathogenicity of a mutation. And this is because in that case, uh, these this, uh, diseases which are highly penetrant are very dependent of only one gene. What happened, as we have seen in more complex diseases, is that one mutation cannot explain the, 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 the phenotype. Uh, this is because, uh, this is an example, um, because um, what we mentioned before, so uh, mutation are, uh, within a context, so it depends on the, it is not only a matter of the gene is broken, but is what happened to your neighbors uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the factory of the um, metabolic pathway or your neighbors in the circuit, right? 
So um, what we can do is to, to trade mutations as perturbations. Uh, and study what would be the effect of the perturbation in a, in a, in a complex disease and see what, uh, what happens. So the, in that way, the, the model will explain us what mutation is important in the definition of the disease and why. So uh, this is uh, diabetes. And diabetes, we found uh, using public data that um, um, these three circuits of these three pathways, which has to do with inflammation, are very relevant in, 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 in diabetes. So um, something that we can do is to try to see what happens if we simulate in a normal tissue the mutations of, of, um, of, uh, of diabetes. We can do the mutations we can mutate um, massively all the genes and see what genes will have an effect on mutation. Interestingly, in this pathway, for example, we see that these three genes, when you mutate in the, this is the control. When you mutate other genes, you get different patterns. When you mutate this spe specific three genes, have exactly the same effect on the pathway that we observe in diabetes. So interestingly, these three genes are, I mean, this, this is, this is the, the, the concept that people use in the case of uh, rare diseases. So mutation should be, uh, should occur in, in, uh, in a low, percentage of the population because rare diseases occur in a low percentage of population. Some mutations that happen in a high proportion of the, of the population, they are probably not disease mutation, but in the case of, uh, of um, diabetes uh, or, or complex diseases, which are more prevalent, is not, is not the case. So we find here are mutation that has a strong effect, a very similar effect, but at the end, there are um, there are quite uh, I mean prevalent in the population. So we are discovering mutations uh, that are clearly adapted to the to the clearly fit to the to the concept of of a disease, right? Um, so let me. Uh, let me show you what's next yeah, for entering in the last part of the talk. So we, we depend on the on the on the models, and the model depend on the on the pathway. So uh, currently, only one third of the genome can be modeled, and this model is represented by uh, these arrows that connect gene to gene and define the the, the functionalities. And the generation of this knowledge is a slow process uh, because, uh, you know, uh, this generation requires years of laboratory work and you need to formulate a testing hypothesis on particular relationship between genes and molecules, etc. Uh, so the idea is, would it be possible to use machine learning to generate biological knowledge from data? This is something in which we are very interested now. Um, so what happen is that in the cases in which they are generating um, this knowledge, the scenario is completely different than in our case. So we are talking about very few variables and lots of samples. But now in our case, we have lots of variables and we don't have so many samples. So we have a problem of dimensionality in many of our uh, scenarios. So what we can do or we try to do is to try to learn this knowledge from the data to reducing uh, this course of dimensionality. So the idea would not be to learn everything uh, one at, uh, in, in one shot, but to try to use the uh, already known parts of the functionality to make new links from other proteins around, right? So 
in that case, we reduce the number of potential causal, re causal relationship and we can use other so more sophisticated models for causality, like uh, we saw yesterday, or use uh, experimental validation. So, so let me show you a practical application. This is a, a project that was funded by Fundación BBVA, in which we uh, did systematic drug reproposition in rare diseases. So we, we took the the, uh, the ideas to take the um, the um, uh, disease map of rare diseases and to try to link other proteins outside of the map to part of this map, part of this pathway, right? So um, just mention that. Um, um, I mean, uh, reproposing in, in rare disease is important because um, companies are not going to invest in new new drugs, so it's important that uh, we can find this. So, um, and the idea is at the end is to try to use all this information of gene expression across many organs and to try to say, okay, we have this. Um, this uh, in, in any organ, we have the we calculate this uh, activity pathway of the of the of, of the activities of the pathways of the disease map, and we have also the uh, activities of other genes which belong to 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 the um, targets of other drugs, and we can try to predict the activity of this uh, of the disease from this target. So when we did this prediction, the most relevant targets uh, in, the, in, this, in this case that we published recently, for example, in Fanconi anemia, we found a number of, of, um, of um, targets which uh, were validated later. So what is interesting here is that uh, we can use machine learning to help to generate biological knowledge in what we call an industrial manner. So this is the case of the of, uh, Fanconi anemia. One of the targets was uh, EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor gene. And uh, two of the drugs that we predicted to, for it to be uh, active were demonstrated to be active by a, 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 a collaborative group. So we apply similar concept to, to COVID. Uh, we model the mechanisms of entry of uh, immune response, et cetera, et cetera. And we found several a number of drugs, as many of them were uh, in trial. Some of them are not used. But we know, for example, that chlorokine, uh, in theory, is effective. But in practice, it, it affects too many pathways. So we can see that. Even if it is in theory active, in practice could have a lot of secondary effects, right? So some of the drugs that were in trial uh, were uh, predicted, and other more recent drugs that target the most relevant proteins here that were like uh, that were uh, interleukin antagonists, like inhibitors, etc., were also predicted by the system. So we have a version of the Hepatia modeled here in the Hepatia babylonis COVID. And you can have a look at them. And just my last or almost last slide, um, there is another um, site that we are exploring now, also that are uh, this interpretable neural network, which is to code, the idea is to code uh, the biological know, uh, knowledge into neural network architecture. So that some of the layers should represent uh, uh, the, the real connection, the known connection between the genes in terms uh, here, in terms of uh, pathway activity, in terms of uh, regulation, or in terms of protein protein interaction. And then we can see what are the relationship between these uh, biological biased uh, relationships. So, this is a worker which is um, doing now Pelin, and Pelin, our student uh, in the net in the ITN. And Pelin will develop a little bit more later. And uh, this uh, work is uh, being uh, supervised also by Carlos Lucer and, and Isabel Nepomuceno. 
And just to finish, uh, to mention that um, uh, because of this type of modeling and this type of uh, application, we probably would be a step closer to the precision medicine era in which we can take decisions uh, and action based on knowledge. And just to mention that we have uh, all this software available and you can use, you can, the models can be used in a very nice way through a web um, interface, but there is a bioconductor and a um, cytoscape application. And um, well, I mean, that's more or less all. So thank you very much. And I would be happy of taking questions you have. Thank you very much, Joaquin, for this very interesting talk. Um, are there any questions from the consortium on Zoom for us? Not at the moment. Oh, there is one from Catalina. Giovanni Visona. Ah, Hi, hello. Thank you for the talk. First of all, it was really interesting. What I wanted to ask is, you mentioned that there is a lot of variability between the cells within a cancer tumor. Is there a way to leverage this variability to use it to increase our understanding on how these pathways are affected? Or is it just an obstacle to be overcome? Well, I mean, both. <laughs> Both are true. So we, we can use uh, that to understand how pathways um, are responsible for these different uh, behaviors. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's, it's a real problem, as you, as you could see, because um, if some of your cells, I mean, what happened there, do you remember the, the slide in which uh, we have this different uh, um, activity of the, of the the drug on the cell. So what happened is that you typically kill most of the cell. So you are free of cancer, at least uh, phenotypically free of cancer. And then what happened is that in some of the, I mean, some months, you start to develop cancer again. And then you get the treatment again and the cells are resistant. As we say, okay, the cells became resistant. No, it's not true. What happened is that the non-resistant cells that were the active clones were killed. And the silly clone, which was very inefficient and was a very low uh, level, but was resistant, was there. And then the, the silly clone without any other competition, com competition then spreads out. And when you try it again, then the clone is resistant. So what we should do is to re-sequence again the cancer and to see what is the drug that we can use with this clone. So probably in that case, we could be able of fighting more efficiently the, the cancer. Obviously, we don't have uh, drugs for all the solutions. This is something that will happen in the future. But we still have a, a very nice arsenal of drugs. And probably we could manage many of these situations instead of just saying, OK, we can do nothing because the the the, the conventional treatment is not working. But maybe another treatment could work. Thank you. And there are some questions on Slido. Um, so Tom wants to know, do pathway repositories get updated automatically with new publications or do they get curated by humans or both? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it depends on the repository, but typically they are exploring automatically the, the literature and then the uh, humans um, sort of uh, supervise uh, the information that they put inside. But in general, they are quite well curated. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question by Tom uh, and he asks, is overfitting a big problem to tackle when trying to develop multigenic biomarkers? Um, I mean, yes, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it could be a serious problem. Uh, what we try to do is, I mean, to reduce the dimensionality of the problem by, on one hand, to try, trying to use uh, biological information. So we just, uh, I mean, typically try to exclude genes which for sure would not be related. Um, but this is dangerous because in that case, we are, you probably, 
will never discover new things. But you can use also data to try to say, okay, these genes never co-express probably with the with the with what we did in the, in the last examples of the reposition. So what we try to see is what genes could be used to predict uh, the um, the activity of the pathways. But in that case, was reduced to genes which were useful for us because they were uh, already targets for other drugs. So I mean, you can reduce it in different ways, but uh, if you want to discover from scratch, mm, it's a problem, yeah. Okay, um, there's one more question also by Tom. Um, he says, great talk. Uh, he has another question. So in GEO, how is the linking between the super categories and the sub categories done? What, uh, I don't understand the question, in GEO? In TO, how is the linking between supercategories and subcategories done? Ah, in GEO, yes. I mean, uh, uh, well, I mean, it, there is a description of these categories and supercategories. So, so what, what the, the question is that... Uh, um, so, he, he basically asked uh, how the linking between super, uh, supercategories and subcategories is done. Uh, well, I mean, it has been done by curators. So it's, um, in some cases, I mean, you go one by one in some cases, it doesn't make much, much sense in some cases. But this is this always in, in, you know, in redefinition. But he has, I mean, they have been defined by curators. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions also from the consortium? Um, it doesn't look like there are any other questions. So thanks a lot, Joaquin. You get a round of virtual applause for your talk. Thanks a lot for your talk. Yeah.